You're not going to be using the sick care system if you are healthy, if you are getting to the gym, eating well, creating a sense of community, and reducing your stress. That's where the money's at. I've worked in three hospitals, seeing COVID for the last close to four years. I still haven't taken care of somebody that was completely healthy. The stuff that you do saves lives. The reason I was really excited to, to join you guys is because the, there's a message that needs to go out here th that the stuff that you do saves lives. And before the pandemic, which we're going to get into in a second here, as a, as a frontline ICU doc, didn't really put much thought into prevention, really thinking about uh, the things that we don't learn about in medical school. But I've seen firsthand now how impactful it is to keep our population healthy. So at the end of this all, I want you to feel inspired to keep doing what you're doing and th continue to thrive for excellence. Okay, so my only disclosure, I have no financial disclosure, but I authored a book on our experience throughout the pandemic. All right, so almost four years, folks. March 2020. I gotta say, I, my, our lives, all of our lives changed dramatically at that time. But as, a, as an ICU family, I'm gonna call it an ICU family because it really is a family. It really was something else. It was really scary, to be frank. You saw what was happening in Italy, saw what was happening in New York, and all of a sudden now you're hearing about cases coming into our city, I'm in Ottawa, and, and we're getting ready for the storm. And, and you're, so many thoughts happen. So I was, I was there for our very first case in, of, of COVID in our ICU at the General Hospital about March 20, 20th, uh, 2020. And all those thoughts come to mind. Kathy and I, we had that sit down, like when, if I get COVID, when I get COVID, well, how are we gonna handle it? We have grandma in the house, immunocompromised folks. And so we really, we were scared. And I'll say, I don't know, I know there's a few frontline uh, healthcare providers here, but we weren't that ready. Like we weren't really ready for what to, to expect. And so what, what was, striking and what was challenging was, was what we saw frontline. Like when we saw those patients die by themselves, when we saw the, the fear, the fear in those, those patients right before being intubated and knowing that their future was not looking bright, it was, it was scary. And being in that situation, you really wanted to do everything you can to get your patients through. You really wanted to do everything, learn. What can we do to get our patients through so we didn't have to see them suffer the way they had to suffer? And unfortunately, one of the things that was abundantly clear, so once again, you're, you're in a situation where you're fearing your, the safety of yourself and your family, but you realize not everyone had the same risk with time. We saw more and more of a link with people with metabolic syndrome people with obesity, type 2 diabetes, people with dyslipidemia or, or high cholesterol. And for some reason, this message wasn't getting out. It really wasn't going. And I'm, so I'm up in Canada, and at that time, I was starting to do COVID updates locally and nationally on the news. And every time I had a chance to speak to one of the coordinators of the, like the news stories, I was saying, yo, you gotta let us talk about this metabolic syndrome angle. Like, I'm legit, and, and uh, people give me a tough time saying this, but personally, I've never taken care of an unhealthy person in the ICU. Has it happened somewhere? Of course it's happened. You know, just by sheer numbers, there's gonna be somebody that died and that was healthy in the ICU. But me, personally, after I've worked in three hospitals, seeing COVID for the last close to four years, I still haven't taken care of somebody that was completely healthy. And why aren't we spreading the word about this? Because when you look at our, and, and the data was, was out early. We saw data out of China showing an association of about 90% of our patients were associated, or in, the, in China were associated with obesity. And so it was clear, and this is what we were seeing. And even, and, and then one of the, the striking messages too that was coming across is 
during later waves, you would see younger patients coming across. I think I was talking to Dawn about this earlier. If you were to take, so we, in my case, we saw, we saw a handful of people in their 20s and early 30s. The, aver- the lowest weight of one of the younger demographics that I saw was 275 pounds, right? And if you looked at the chart, you know what it would say? Healthy 27-year-old. You can't walk up steps, of two flights of steps, and you're gonna be, we're calling our, these folks healthy. And this was the message. Then, then what happens? We got our lockdowns, right? So you got this disease that was clearly focusing on our elderly, our immunocompromised, but significantly for our metabolically unhealthy. And what do we do? We tell them to socially isolate. We heard uh, Dr. Tom McCoy talking about the importance of connection. We saw uh, folks being told not to go outside, get that vitamin D. We told folks that the gyms are closed. You, can, you cannot exercise in a gym. And what happened? Y'all heard about uh, COVID-15? Maybe COVID-20 for folks? Put on that extra pounds? So what are we doing to their risk facts, risk factors? And, and think about the opportunity too. I'm going a little bit off script here, but think about the opportunity between those first and second waves or what, where it's, we're going into May, we're going into June. Imagine public health saying, like, we see this link. Let's all co- collectively try and get healthier. You know what I'm saying? Like, why not? You know, you know cardiovascular d- disease, strokes, cancer, all get improved by us getting uh, physically healthier and you reduce your risk of getting sick and dying from COVID. Imagine that movement and how appealing it would be and how powerful a message that could have been. All right, so we talked about earlier in the morning about the lack of education when it comes to the medical profession, when it comes to nutrition. So I, I've, so I'm many years out of medical school, unfortunately, but I, I still, Ask the kids, like I call the kids, the trainees, how, many, like, how much hours of, of nutrition and education are you get? And they'll be like, one lecture, maybe two. Exercise, that doesn't exist. And, and so somebody, uh, I have a podcast, and, and somebody put, the, put uh, in front of me when I start to talk about the, type, um, the metabolic syndrome, they're like, Have you heard of Jason Fung and the diabetic code and reversing type 2 diabetes? I was like, reversing type 2 diabetes, you're talking gibberish. I've never heard of that. I'm internally, internal medicine trained. This is voodoo to me, right? And then you start reading this shit. (laughs) And then you start talking to folks and you're like, holy mackerel, you're reversing type 2 diabetes? And I, none of us, had an idea about this. I had no clue, like, you, you, I go to your family doctor now, grill that cat and ask them, can you, how do you reverse type 2 diabetes? And they'll look at you with the, the eyes wide open, uh, thinking you're, you, you, know, you need to be co- admitted to a psych ward or something. It's baffling that this isn't front and center. And so I start to investigate. I start getting some of these thought leaders on the show. I got Ken Berry, who's reversed over 400 patients from their type two diabetes. I said, what? But, but Vanessa Spina, she's keto, uh, her nickname, uh, online ketogenic girl, her uh, Instagram handle. I'm learning about keto, like ketogenic diet. I thought that's just for uh, epileptic children. They're like, oh, you, like this is a tool that we're seeing to reverse people's diabetes in weeks. Talk to Brett Scher about reversing people's cardiovascular risk through diet. I was like, wow, man, we gotta, we gotta put this out in the world. We gotta keep, we gotta start getting that message out. But once again, nobody was listening. Nobody was listening. This is an episode I did with a colleague of mine. And just to, to kind of reinforce the idea of what we were seeing as frontline ICU docs, 
he saw what everything I mentioned, saw the link with, with type two diabetes, with obesity, and he was a heavier set guy. And because of what he was seeing frontline, because of what he was seeing in the ICU, through intermittent fasting, a little bit of low carb, because of, and, and a bit of exercise as well, he was able to, he, he lost 30 pounds, reduced his risk of, of landing in, in the hospital and dying in the ICU from what he was seeing. And to me, this was such a, a profound moment because if he sees what we see, and he's battled weight his whole life, but the fact that he saw this, imagine if everybody else had that message, what would it mean? And even outside the COVID admissions, like if you land in hospital, you land in an intensive care unit, this, it's, it's a horrible experience. It really is. Like if you think about your inability to communicate, like you, you have a, you have a, a tube in your, in your windpipe, you, you, you're unable to, uh, you're tied down because if you grab towards your windpipe, uh, people will, will, will tie you down so they don't they want to secure your airway. You can't easily com communicate if you're anxious, if you're in pain. A lot of our patients leave with PTSD, anxiety, depression, significant mental health issues. And then you think about, we, we were talking, uh, Dr. Lyon was talking about sarcopenia and muscle loss as you age, about Every day you're on a ventilator, at least for your first two weeks, you're losing about 2% of your muscle mass. And so, actually, people are quite uh, shocked when I say this. It's actually quite hard to die in an ICU. Like, for real. Because I'll tell you, we're, we have advanced ways of, of providing ventilation and oxygen to people's, uh, to people's bodies, whether that's through a ventilator or through bypass. We can replace the kidneys through dialysis. There's some options for livers, and de depending on the center you're at. We support your heart. It is hard to die. But what does it come down to? It comes down to your quality of life. It comes down to your function. That's, that's, the, that's the X factor. And when you go through a prolonged ICU admission, you do not come out the same person. I'll give you an example. We had older; these are older studies, but pe people that had ARDS from uh, influenza. Uh, these are earlier in the 2000 studies. You could be 25 years old, and you would still be short of breath going up the steps after a, sig a significant uh, um, ARDS episode. So it really comes down to like not wanting to see people. Like, I want you not to see me in an ICU for these reasons. We talked a lot about protein, and we talked a lot about the, the value of, of, of staying strong, staying fit, and, and muscle mass, lean muscle mass. I want to get, tell you a quick story about our friend, Dr. Dr. Ron. And he's given me permission to tell the story. He was, he was a neighbor in our, in our old neighborhood, Retired family physician, and he's about 77 years old. Hits the gym five days a week. Like, you know what time you guys were rucking? Because I wasn't there. <laughs> I ain't driven. I was, uh, that was too early. I, was, I, was, I can't remember who said this, but we got three kids at home. I am resting. <laughs> so it was, uh, he's, he's 77 years old. Very active guy. Goes to the gym five days a week resistance training, and he's uh, playing around with his kids. He tries to, to jump on his couch, falls backwards, breaks his neck, dies for three to five minutes. He has no pulse. He passes, he dies. Okay. Luckily, his, his wife is a retired nurse, pro provides CPR immediately, and gets him to hospital, gets revived, and has a very complicated stay in, in, in the intensive care unit, ends up in hospital for about three months. But, and ultimately makes it home. He's at home now, playing with his grandkids. He's, he's, he, he survives. 
and not just survives, he thrives, considering all that, that has happened to him. This isn't an exact picture of him, but this is, he's one of the few guys in RICU that insisted on walking while he was on a ventilator. And I could promise you, any 70, your typical 77-year-old gentleman that comes into an intensive care unit is not walking on a ventilator and is not making it home after dying for five minutes. That's the power of exercise. That's the power of, of, of being fit. That mental space that he was in throughout, saying, I'm getting up. I've, I've been, how, how many days when people wanted me to go rucking, I, I decided to get up anyway and show up. That is why he's home today. That is the power of exercise. And that's what you guys could bring to your clients and to your, and to your community every day. More, we're seeing more and more concepts of this too, applying in, in everyday life. So there's, I don't know if any of you have heard of the, the term prehab. So one of our, our docs in Ottawa, he really set up a, an amazing program where instead of just focusing on rehabilitation after you leave, or after your op operation, after you leave hospital, let's get you prepped and, 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 and strong before going into hospital. So he set up these four to six week programs that are, have been shown to reduce complications, reduce your stay in hospital, and once again, allow you to be more functional. I was uh, sharing a story with, uh, where is he? Uh, Chase, where are you at? Yeah, Chase, yesterday you were telling me about one of your, your clients that you were coaching. Broke their ankle in their 80s and is back at the gym. And I guarantee you, someone in their 80s, if they're not going to, if they're not seeing you or being active at that age, I don't know if they're getting back to a gym or any level of function. And by the way, this coach, oh my God, I, I call him Coach Sarcasm. We're doing the, um, we're doing the uh, um, snatches. He's like, bring your hands closer together. And I was like, really? He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, already like stressed out or looking at it. <laughs> Everyone's up near me with their shirts off too. And God damn. Coach Sarcasm for the win. More on the power of exercise. So this is Dr. Julie Fauché, former Croft, CrossFit athlete. And her, she has an amazing podcast, Pursuing Health. This is Roger Boyer. And this amazing individual has brought the CrossFit life in an in indigenous population, right? So he, through his initiatives in the communities that are high in type two diabetes, high in obesity, high in, in, in just uh, in, in dying at a younger age. He's bringing a weapon for, the, for his community to, to survive and thrive. It, he's, if you ever get to hear about him or look him up, he is doing incredible work. And this is, a, once again, that power that you guys have to save life, to influence your communities. This is so important. All right, we're doing a quiz. We are doing a quiz. So, then this will all make sense in a second. Oh, look, you guys are ahead of the game. I was going to go out. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put you on the spot so you can be accountable. Okay, so. Who's, oh, you guys. Okay, so. In terms of the average cost per day in an intensive care unit, hands up for A, 3,500, B for 1,500, C for 2,000, D for 5,000. Oh, it's A, sorry guys. <laughs> mind you, mind you, this is Canadian data. I should have I I prefaced this, but but, 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 I am 93% sure if you, if you were to look it up, it's the same in, in the US. All right. Uh, this time I, I promised I would pick on, on one person today, and his name is Big Mike. Where's Big Mike at? 
<laughs> there you are. All right, you're going to answer the next question. What's the average cost of an ICU ward patient? A, B, C, or D? This is Canadian dollars. It actually, it was B, about 21,000. All right, and next I'm gonna pick on Little Mike. I don't know if Little Mike is here. Big squat, no, okay, we'll ask the, the audience. Okay, once again, Canadian, this I don't actually know for US, but this is Canadian cost. What is the average cost of a COVID ICU patient? So A, 42,000, let's see some hands. Okay, don't have, no hands there. B, 35,000, C, 22,000, and D, 52,000. Yeah, total state average, yeah. So it's D, 52,000. Okay, and there's a reason I'm going behind this. My research platform, we, we cut the intro or, uh, early, but I, my, my research platform, our, our group is focused on, on how to make healthcare more efficient. How do you reduce spending and also improve the healthcare delivery, right? And we formulate this huge team to, to look at studies. And we're putting out papers 10 to 20 a year. And it, there was just a big aha moment for me when we were focusing often our, our studies on, like, I don't know if anyone's got it, like, I know there's some medical folk in the, in, the, in, in the middle here, but we were focusing on interventions, whether you use antibiotic A versus B, use this, solu you know, use uh, this IV solution instead of albumin. And yeah, you could, by doing that, you could save hundreds and thousands, hundreds or thousands of dollars. But to me, the big aha moment for our group happened while we were in the pandemic, saying like, it's not about the interventions that we're doing. Like, what about the prevention, right? You saw that, you saw those ridiculous cost numbers associated with one COVID admission, okay? $52,000 for a COVID admission, right? With a condition that's associated with, uh, like, lifestyle, uh, with lifestyle changes. Like, if we were to help improve people's health status, we could pre be preventing admissions. And once again, not just COVID, you're talking about cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, all could be improved. So this was a huge aha moment for me. Prevention, that is the prescription. I mean, you heard it earlier today. You see all Roger Boye, get people to the box, get people to the gym. You're not gonna be using the sick care system if you are healthy, if you are getting to the gym eating well, creating a sense of community, and reducing your stress. That's where the money's at. And so, once again, when I think about what we could be doing with that kind of cake, right? That 52,000, you prevent a couple of those admissions alone. You get people gym access. You get people access to better nutrition or even better, just nutrition advice. People have no idea what to do. Go on your IG right now. Again, to people tell you, eat this, eat that. It's hard to navigate through, but getting that kind of guidance, life changing. Focus on whole foods. Fit, get people fitness trackers. I say even that, man. Get a, uh, get a $20 Fitbit, and you tell me you get 10,000 steps five days a week, get a rebate on your taxes or your insurance or something. Like, start thinking outside the box here. Make your city, this is a bigger, bigger picture, but make your city more walkable. Like invest in prevention and we'd be so much further ahead. Once again, this is a bit for the, the medical folk in, in the, the audience. This is something that just, I hope none of you have been hospitalized recently, but if you saw what we feed our patients, it is crazy. I'll start with one quick sidebar. I was walking by a room. I was, it wasn't even my patient. I'm walking by this room, and I see the most disturbing meal with this patient. And I, 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 like, I had to stop. I'm like, what are you eating, my friend? And he's like, this is pureed French toast. <laughs> I 
I took that thing, I chucked it. I'm like, I'm gonna get you some real food, son. This is horrible. And, but the point being, like not only the quality of the food, but what we feed our, our, our patients, high in, in saturated and um, uh, refined carbs, high in seed oil. We, we feed our, our patients continuously. So I, I just encourage like, folks to maybe think about pushing the envelope a bit. I was really uh, pleased with our research group that looked at could low carb diets be impactful in the intensive care unit? And we talked about earlier, this is not necessarily for everyone, but we're all about personalization, but is there a subset of patients could, that, that could really benefit from this? Maybe they have a keto approach as well. I think it's time to think outside the box a little bit. One thing that I would be remiss not to mention is COVID truly did discriminate. We saw a lot of people of color contract COVID, die from COVID. In, in my country, and I'm assuming in, in the US too, a lot of people that looked like me were essential workers. They couldn't stay home. They were working in the nursing homes. They were working in the, uh, in the as your Uber drivers, the Amazon factory workers. And it was really, it's hard to see. It really was hard to see that these communities were getting, were being hit really hard. And one of the components that we also did see is obviously there was a lot of a link to diabetes and obesity in some of our communities. And early in the early in the pandemic, there was a lot of talk on, oh, is there a genetic predisposition to X, Y, Z? And as far as I'm con concerned, it was socioeconomics. It was, I don't have time to go to a gym when I'm in a multi-generational home barely making ends meet and having to still work. And, and what am I eating? I'm not eating whole foods. I'm eating whatever's readily available, right? Highly processed foods. And, and I, so I do want to say that I do not think the, the genetic piece is, is fair. I think it's something that's high, highly associated with so, uh, socioeconomics. So what our group is, we're a group of action. We, we applied for a couple of grants and as of this spring, we're looking at, uh, at a multidisciplinary approach to reversing type two diabetes in our black communities and in, in my home province. So we're nutritionists, health coach, uh, access to uh, personal trainers and see if we can put a dent on this thing. Cause not, of us, not, not enough of us are talking about how do we hit the communities that need us the most and, and impact their lives in that way. All right, so we're near the end here. I'm gonna ask a small favor. You guys have been sitting up a little bit. I want you all to get up for a second. Everyone stand up. A little stretch. Okay, first thing, first thing I want you to do, give yourself a round of applause for showing up, folks. The, the, the fact that you are here, I'm telling you, says a lot, and it's going to make a difference. And I'm gonna lean on you a bit more here in, in terms of call to action. I think the message that is in this room has been amazing, but we need to spread the word. We need to increase the awareness that the power of exercise, the power of, of community, the power of eating well, you guys have it in you. And I really think for us to bring out that message, it, it's there. And so for some of you, it's about telling your story. We've heard some beautiful stories today about the, the power of CrossFit, what it's brought to, the, brought to their lives, and what it's bringing to your community. So spread the word. Be open to your, telling your story. Collaborate. Be creative. I've heard some beautiful, wonderful stories on uh, uh, like linking up with insurance companies, linking up with physios, linking up with other health organizations get ingrained, to get that word out and people to see, get exposed to CrossFit. And once again, that's gonna, that's gonna save lives. And the last thing I ask of you is, think about how you could reach the people that need you the most. The marginalized communities that have suffered for many years and that have the highest incidences of, of metabolic disease. Let's, let's reach out and get to the communities that need us the most. 
Last thing I'll say. Um, I want to say a quick word. My mom, uh, recently, she, she passed a couple of months ago. And one of the beautiful, thing, beautiful things my mom would do is elevate everyone around her. She had an amazing smile. She had an amazing energy. And if we could leave you with a message today and a feeling and a sentiment is y'all have it within you. You guys are going to create some amazing things in the world and it starts today. So thank you very much. <laughs>